Hello, and thanks again for joining us today on PHA Classroom. We are going to be um, presenting to you PH 101, What You Need to Know, Part 2 of our PH 101 series. This um, session is Diagnostics and Treatment Options. My name is Jill Zajac. I am the Patient Education Program Manager. Today I have with me um, Dr. Jean Elwing joining me today as our presenter. Jean Elwing completed her undergraduate in medical education at St. Louis University. She remained at St. Louis University and completed a residency in internal medicine and pediatrics. She received her fellowship training in pulmonary and critical care medicine at the University of Cincinnati. In 2007, she joined the faculty in the College of Medicine at the University of Cincinnati. She's currently a professor of medicine and the director of the pulmonary hypertension program in the division of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. Her clinical and research focus is pulmonary vascular disease and pulmonary hypertension. Thank you so much for joining me. If you're interested and you haven't listened to part one, you may want to start there because we really talk about the nuts and bolts of what pulmonary hypertension is. In this session, we're going to talk about how to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. Go on to talk about treatment options how to work with your pulmonary hypertension team, and how to get the support you need to feel the best you can. These are all extremely important and we're gonna to touch on all of these topics. So let's talk about your symptoms. Pulmonary hypertension has variable symptoms. Some of you may just be a little bit short of breath, but some may have much more advanced symptoms like chest pain with walking, swelling, swelling in the abdomen, or feeling like they're dizzy or near fainting when they walk. Your symptoms help you understand what's going on because we want them to get better as we treat you, but they also tell us how aggressive we need to be with your medications to help us get you where you need to be as quickly as possible. In order to diagnose pulmonary hypertension properly, we need to do a large battery of tests. We're gonna go through each of these individually and give you a little bit of sense on time commitment and what these actually entail. When we meet anybody who's short of breath, we look at, is it something easy like asthma exacerbation? I'm not saying asthma is not difficult in terms of management, but easy to identify. You might be wheezing, coughing, you might have a bronchitis. Or it could be more difficult, like pulmonary arterial hypertension, to sort out. We oftentimes start with blood tests. These oftentimes are quick, easy to obtain, readily available, and frequently right there in your doctor's office. They take about five minutes to complete, and we learn a lot about things. We learn the whys sometimes in terms of pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension. Do you have underlying connective tissue disease? or could you have an infection that's associated with pulmonary hypertension? We also learn about how well you're tolerating your pulmonary hypertension. And we learn about that by looking at your BNP or the NT pro BNP. The higher that is, the more stress and strain on the right side of the heart. We oftentimes also do chest x-rays. This is relatively quick, easy test, widely available, takes about five minutes. It tells us about what the lungs look like, but it also tells us if the heart's enlarged, if there's big pulmonary arteries, or there's something else clearly abnormal with your lung shape or the chest wall shape that could be affecting your breathing. We oftentimes, when patients are short of breath and we cannot identify clearly why, go on to a CAT scan. There's many different CAT scans of the chest or CTs of the chest. This test takes 15 to 30 minutes and it may or may not have dye associated with it. We wanna know what your lung tissue looks like. We wanna know if there's scarring, we wanna know if there's fluid, and if we put dye in that test, we also can look for blood clots in the lungs. And in patients who have pulmonary hypertension, we oftentimes can see enlargement of the right side of the heart. In this individual here, we can see 
the right side of the heart is bigger than the left side of the heart. And this is consistent with that individual's diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. So we learn a lot about how your lungs look and how the heart looks in that chest on a CAT scan. So now we oftentimes have to go on and complement what we already know with additional testing. The VQ scan is our best test to look for old blood clots in the lungs. It tells us through multiple different mechanisms, and I'm gonna explain that to you, of how blood is going and the air is going in your lungs. This first image here is where the air is going. You're breathing a medicine in, and then we can see pictures of where it's going through the VQ scan. That's the ventilation part of the scan. And then you're gonna get a medicine through an IV and it's gonna to flow to your lungs and we're gonna see where that medicine goes. And if it does not go to all parts of your lungs, you may have blocks in those small arteries in your lungs or the bigger arteries in your lungs, and that could be blood clots. It doesn't always have to be blood clots, but that's what we're looking for. So we're looking where the air is going, where the blood is going, and if they're matching. Pulmonary function tests, they're a test that you might also be asked to do. They take 45 minutes to an hour. They are a bit of work. If you're short of breath, be prepared that you're going to be tired after this test. We're gonna see how easy the air is flowing in your lungs and how much air is trapped in the lungs or how small or large the lung volumes are. This gives us a lot of information about the health of your airways and lung tissue. And in addition to that, it can give us a number called a DLCO, which is the diffusing capacity. And that tells us how well the oxygen is getting from the air sacs into the bloodstream. The lower that is, the harder it is to get oxygen into your bloodstream. And sometimes that gives us a bit of information about how well you're doing with your pulmonary hypertension. We oftentimes ask you to do a walk test. This is a six minute walk test that may feel like an eternity when you're short of breath. Our goal is when you're treated and you're feeling better, that this is much less difficult. We wanna know how far you walk in six minutes because that tells us a lot about how well you're doing. I would love for that to improve over time, but definitely don't want it to get worse over time. This helps us know in part how aggressive to be with your medicines. Earlier, we talked about testing, including echocardiograms in part one. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about echocardiograms. These are an essential piece of your workup for pulmonary hypertension. They tell us about how healthy the right heart is, how healthy the left heart is, and they give us a non-invasive way to estimate the blood pressure in your lungs. This is about a 45 minute to hour test and as I said, tells us a lot about structure and function of the heart and the pulmonary pressures. So now this is tricky. So bear with me here and just uh, follow along, replay this if you need to. So as I said, we look at structure and function of the heart. And the heart, as you remember from earlier, is four chambers. The blood comes into the vena cavas, the superior or inferior, dumps into the right atrium, goes out to the right ventricle and out to the lungs. And then if you look at these pictures from this echo, you're saying that that doesn't look anything like that picture above it. But it's because of the way we look at the heart with ultrasound. We are looking from the bottom of the heart to the top. That's how the probe looks at the heart. And that's why it's in this shape. So, if you look at this heart upside down and backwards, we're gonna have the right side over here and the left side on the right side. So again, remember upside down and backwards, but we wanna know how is the right heart looking as compared to the left heart. The right heart should always be smaller than its left heart in a normal pressured person. Not a normal person, normal pressured person, because uh, we're all normal uh, as far as we can think. So when your pressures are high in your lungs, 
it causes stress and strain on the right heart. That right heart tries its hardest to work. It gets thicker and stiffer and tries to pump through those small blood vessels that are being narrowed by pulmonary arterial hypertension. But over time, it can't compensate as well and it gets dilated and, and just doesn't work as well as it should. And you can see here, if you can compare this normal right heart to a pulmonary hypertension heart, we'll see that the right heart is bigger than the left heart. And you can see the right atrium, the top part of the right heart, is much bigger than the left atrium. So just a very nice visual of how pulmonary hypertension affects the heart and what we're specifically looking for on that echocardiogram. And some of you, if you're not newly diagnosed and you've had multiple echoes over time, you will quickly get to see these pictures and recognize these structures when you have your echocardiograms. Normal, and as I said, a pulmonary hypertension affected right heart. So those are our standard routine pulmonary hypertension workup tests. But some of you may say, but I've had other things. Well, we do add additional testing as needed. Some people, when they come to me who have mild pulmonary hypertension and they do have time to get additional testing, and I'm worried that some of their pulmonary hypertension could be due to things like sleep apnea, I'm gonna explore that more and try to optimize that prior to going to diagnostic tests like right-sided heart catheterization. And that would require an overnight pulse ox to check your oxygen with sleep, and then a sleep study or a polysomnogram to see if you need CPAP or BiPAP to help you breathe better during sleep, which can sometimes help the pulmonary pressures. For those patients who I'm concerned have old blood clots in the lungs or chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, we might do a pulmonary angiogram, which is a test that really looks at the small and medium-sized blood vessels in the lungs for those old blood vessels, old blood clots we might find that require different kind of treatment. We sometimes do exercise testing to really drill down on how short a breath you are and what's causing it. Some people need a left heart catheterization to sort out, do you have blockages in the arteries in your heart? Are you at risk of a heart attack? Do we need to do something about that to help you feel better? And then some individuals need cardiac MRI. If I have suspicion that you could have a hole in your heart you were born with, or something changed in terms of how the heart is functioning that I want to learn more about, cardiac MRI is a great tool and it gives very, very nice pictures to tell us what's going on with the structure and sometimes about the function of the right and left heart. So these tests complement our workup so far. When we get all of the information we need, then we go on to the definitive, the diagnostic test, the test that's absolutely essential to make sure we understand your pulmonary hypertension. That is the right heart catheterization. This is an outpatient procedure most of the time, but say you're sick in the hospital, we sometimes do it then. The majority of the time outpatient, it is invasive. The important things we do to try to reduce your risk of this invasive procedure is we try to do it in centers that have a lot of experience, in cath labs or cardiac catheterization labs that have done this many times, and do it under x-ray guidance so we know exactly where the catheter is going. This test tells us, one, if you have pulmonary hypertension, and two, what those pressures are coming from, and three, the severity of the pressures and its effect on the right heart. I'd like you to concentrate here on this heart, and you can see this catheter coming from the superior vena cava, that vein that drains into the atrium on the right side of the heart, and it will pass with the blood flow to the right ventricle, out to the pulmonary artery, and then you actually go along that artery inside of it with the blood flow, and you'll actually wedge it. The wedge pressure, which we've talked about multiple times, actually totally occludes the blood flow in one of the branches of the pulmonary arteries, and it tells us where the pressure is coming from. If we stop the blood flow briefly in the pulmonary artery, we can see, is the pressure coming from the left heart, or is it really coming from the lung blood vessels? And that helps us know, do we treat your left heart or do we treat pulmonary vascular changes? Extremely important because 
very different management, as you will see in the next few slides. So we need to put all our findings together to determine the cause of your pulmonary hypertension, because that will determine best options for management. All right, now let's put it together. This is overwhelming, but just bear with me. We'll, we'll go through this step by step. You present to a physician, you come to me, you tell me you're short of breath. We do some routine things. We diagnose you with whatever we can find, we address it. But if we don't find a cause, we look further. We go on to that echocardiogram. We wanna see, is there a change on your echocardiogram that's worrisome for pulmonary hypertension? We go on to additional workup. We wanna know about your lung function. We, know, we wanna know about blood clots in the lungs and we wanna know about the lung tissue. This will help us branch off and determine what to do next. Do we treat your left heart disease? Do we treat your lung disease? Do we give you blood thinners because we're concerned about blood clots? And then eventually we get to our diagnostic procedure. If we are still concerned about pulmonary hypertension, that is, as you remember, the right-sided heart catheterization. That tells us if the pressures are high, a bit about why they're high, and the severity of its effects on the right side of the heart. We can, in certain circumstances, do testing to see if the blood pressure goes down quickly when you give certain medicines that treat pulmonary hypertension. This helps us know in a select group of patients if you would be a candidate for a routine blood pressure medicine for your pulmonary hypertension. So that is really important because those patients, you may be one of them, could have a long-term response to a routine medicine we give for regular high blood pressure. But if that's negative, or you're not one of those people who would benefit from those medications called calcium channel blockers, we then know a little bit more about the pulmonary hypertension you have, and then can, can, can start planning how best to treat you. We get all of this information and add your results of your walk test to learn about how you're tolerating your pulmonary hypertension. So why is it so important to do all of this? Can't we just get that echo and just treat you? Well, unfortunately, if we did that, we would not make as many people feel better as we'd like because we oftentimes would be treating it incorrectly. So all of this is extremely important to do cor correctly, accurately, and with the least risk to you as possible so we can get to the right diagnosis. So let's break it down now and talk about treatment. Group one disease is pulmonary arterial hypertension. We use special medicines for this that target those small blood vessels. They try to dilate them and allow blood better flow through those small pulmonary arteries. We also will find people who have group two, three, and five disease. We need to treat the underlying condition. We will not make those patients better if we give them group one medicines without treating the underlying problem and group four patients who have old blood clots. We need to figure out what the best treatment is because we can cure group four disease with surgery. We can help people feel better with catheter-based treatments to dilate open those old blood clots. Or in certain circumstances, we use pulmonary hypertension medicines to help patients feel better that are not candidates for surgery or catheter-based interventions. So how do we figure out how to treat people? We look at a lot of things. We look at how you feel. We do risk assessment scores. We put a lot of information in these calculators and find out how well you're doing, not only looking at one thing, but multiple parameters. We look at your background in terms of how old you are. We look at what's caused your pulmonary hypertension. We look at your right heart. We look at your walk distance, your BNP, and we put that all together and that helps us know how aggressive we need to be to get best outcomes. We look at the heart cath numbers specifically, as I mentioned, because it tells us how well your right heart is tolerating everything. We look at your functional class. 
And many of you may be familiar with functional class, but I'm gonna review it briefly. Functional class one, you are not short of breath. You're walking up those three flights of stairs, you're going and taking a brisk walk, no troubles. Functional class four, the other extreme is you're short of breath at rest or you're passing out because of your pulmonary hypertension. Functional class two and three are somewhere in between. Functional class two patients are limited when they're exerting themselves more than usual. They're walking up the stairs carrying something. A functional class three patient is short of breath with routine things around the house. So think about yourself and where you fit in that. We use that information and we would like every single person we treat to get to functional class one or two if possible. We look at your walk distance. We want it to be a certain level. We want you to walk further with medications. And if you walk a very good distance, we want to keep it there. We look at your echo. We want to know that right heart is tolerating the pulmonary hypertension, and we want to look for fluid around the heart that can happen when we're not as well controlled as we'd like to be. We look at how fast things are changing. If your disease is progressing quickly, we need to be very aggressive to slow it down. And we have to talk to you about how you're tolerating all this crazy stuff we're doing to you. Because from your perspective, the most important thing is that you feel better, but you tolerate these things and you can take them. So we get all of this information. We risk assess how you're doing and then see what you can tolerate so we can get you feeling better. So you may or may not be on some medications that are adjunctive, meaning they kind of, they're in the background helping you do better, but they're not specifically targeting your pulmonary hypertension, but extremely important. Those include things like anticoagulants in certain patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension and those patients with chronic blood clots which have caused pulmonary hypertension. We weigh risks and benefits, and we use medications specifically that thin the blood in patients who we found over time benefit. So something to talk to your doctor about. You may or may not be one of those patients. We have a better handle on this than we did five to 10 years ago, and we're only using blood thinners in those specific situations where we've shown people have benefit. Water pills. We want you not to have too much fluid in your body. You feel better when you don't have extra fluid. Your ankles feel better, they look better, but importantly, your right heart functions better. So we wanna get you on water pills or diuretics to keep your fluid balanced. And we wanna change your diet so you don't take in as much salt or fluid, so we don't have to give you as much water pills. So we try to get that sweet spot, the Goldilocks of your fluid intake and water pills. And we use oxygen to keep your saturations above 90%. We know that low oxygen levels can cause vasoconstriction in the lung blood vessels. We want to reduce that because we don't want it, that to be stressing your heart. So we want to keep your blood oxygen levels above 90% at rest with exercise and with sleep. So we'll be checking those things. So now let's talk about medications we use for pulmonary arterial hypertension. If we determine you have group one disease, pulmonary arterial hypertension, blood vessel disease in the lungs, we want to treat you with medications that target those blood vessels. And we have many options. We have three classes of medications, and I'm going to talk about that. And then just know I'm going to talk about it in different ways so you can get a better handle on choices and what we look at for options for you. The first group is the nitric oxide group. That includes our PDE5 inhibitors and our guanylase cyclase stimulators. Those are pills. The second group is prostacyclins. And we can give prostacyclins in pills, we can inhale it, or we can give it infused. And then we can use endothelin receptor blockers, which are pills that try to dilate blood vessels in the lungs. And in addition to that, we're always looking for new medications. We're looking at better ways to use medications in combination, and we're looking for new pathways. So we have our standard three pathways in addition to things we're looking at in clinical trials. So now let's break that down, as I mentioned. 
So first, the nitric oxide pathway. Nitric oxide dilates or opens the small blood vessels in the lungs. It is a vasodilator. We try to increase the nitric oxide effects in the lungs. We do that by phosphodiesterase inhibitors or guanylase cyclase stimulators. Now, that's a lot of, a lot of words, so just um, I'll try to make it as clear as I can. So phosphodiesterase inhibitors are medications like Tadalafil, which is marketed as Adcirca, Aleek, or Cialis, or Sildenafil, which is marketed as Revadio in pulmonary hypertension and Viagra for its other uses. That helps stop breakdown of the products of the nitric oxide pathway to try to keep things vasodilated. The new medication in this group is Riosiguat or Adempis. It turns on the processes that increase those downstream effects of nitric oxide. So we have three choices in this pathway. They work a little bit different, but giving people options because not everybody has the same response to each. Now the next pathway, as I mentioned, is the prostacyclin pathway. We're adding prostacyclin. This dilates small blood vessels, and it is also a vasodilator, as I mentioned, nitric oxide is. These medications in this group can be given multiple ways. We have lots of choices here. This is our oldest pathway, and as I said, we've developed multiple ways to introduce this pathway for our pulmonary hypertension patients over the years. So first I'll mention is troprostanol. This is a medication that can be given orally as arenitram, subcutaneously or IV as remodulin, and inhaled as Tyvaso. Selexapeg is a newer drug, and this is a selective agonist to the receptor for prostacyclin. It's known as Uptravi. Iloprost is a way to inhale prostacyclin, and it's marketed as Ventavis. And epoprostanol, which is our oldest drug, is only given IV as an outpatient medication, and it is given as Flolan or Veletri. So now you get a sense of those two pathways. And then we add our third pathway, which we're actually not adding to. We're trying to block this pathway. This is the endothelin pathway. This is a pathway that narrows blood vessels in the lungs. It's a vasoconstrictor, so we want to stop it. So these are endothelin receptor antagonists. And there's three drugs in this pathway. Massitentin, which is upsummit. Bosentin, which is treclear. Or ambrosentin, which is lateris. All of these are oral medications. So now, put it a little bit different way, still concentrating on the group one disease, pulmonary arterial hypertension, we're gonna break it down on how we give medications. So the first column here is all the medications that can be given orally. We have, as I mentioned, the endothelin receptor antagonists, ambrosentin, bosentin, macetentin, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, sildenafil and tadalafil, the prostacyclin analog, where we're just adding prostacyclin to the system, which is terprostanil, the selective agonist for the receptor, which is a newer drug, which is selexapag or uptravi, or as I mentioned, the medication that turns on the nitric oxide pathway downstream, which is the soluble guanylase cyclase stimulator, Riosigua, otherwise known as Adempis. Then we mentioned the inhaled drugs, two prostacyclins. Those are Iloprost, Ventavis, or inhaled troprostanol, Tyvaso. Subcutaneous delivery through a pump very similar to a diabetic insulin pump, which is troprostanol or remodulin, and our long-standing oldest medications, infusion therapy, epoprostanol, which can be given as Flolan, which is kept on ice, epiprostanol room stable, which is Velletri, or triprostanol, which is remodular. So you get a sense of the pathways and the different delivery mechanisms 
for all of these drugs. So a little bit of alphabet soup here, but just an amazing amount of progress has been made in the last three decades. We went from very little options to all of these options, and we're hoping through clinical trials and your participation in many things that you're doing, we can expand our options over the next decade. So now let's go to the next groups. Group two, how do we treat group two disease? This is where we have left heart disease, weakness, stiffness, valvular heart disease. Well, we treat the underlying problem. We try to reduce that back pressure that the pulmonary vessels are seeing because of the left heart. We repair faulty valves. We treat with diuretics. We give beta blockers or ACE inhibitors. And we work closely with heart failure specialists in this situation. Group three disease is lung disease. We treat the underlying lung disease. We use CPAP and BiPAP for sleep apnea and oxygen if your oxygen levels are low. Very important to treat the underlying cause so patients can feel better and hopefully we can reduce the likelihood of pulmonary hypertension worsening. Group four disease is our old blood clots. These are chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension patients. Specific therapies are effective in patients affected by this condition. We wanna know if the pulmonary pressures are high, how they're affecting the heart, and then where the blood clots are. If they're more central, we can oftentimes do surgery to remove those old blood clots. Sometimes patients are candidates for balloon angioplasty where they have multiple treatments where a small catheter goes into the lungs like the right heart cath and balloons open the narrowing. And that helps the blood flow better and reduces the stress and strain on the heart. And then in some patients who either have had surgery or the balloon angioplasty, or they're not candidates for surgery, may need medications, specific medications for this. And the one medication that is FDA approved at this time is that guanylacyclase stimulator, Rhea Sigmot, otherwise known as Adempis. So extremely important to be seen by an experience center so you find out what your best treatment option is. What is likely to help you the most? Group five, it's a miscellaneous group. Multiple different causes of this condition. Treatment depends on underlying condition. We need to really look for what's causing things and then address that. And importantly here is we really need work and study to better understand how we can impact the pulmonary hypertension in these conditions so people can have better outcomes. So we talked a lot about workup, diagnosis, but the most important thing is that you feel better. So we wanna put it all together. We wanna find the right plan of care for you. We need to look at all the factors, symptoms, examination, testing results, we want to find out what you want from your medications. We want to know how you tolerate your medications. And then we want to talk with you, have open dialogue, and sort out if we're doing well, if we're going in the right direction, if we need to rethink what we're doing, do we need to look for other things that are contributing to your symptoms so we can help you feel better. And what you need to remember here is you are the most important person in this whole equation. We want you to do better, feel better, and get the things from your life that you want. So we need to talk to you, you need to talk to us, so we can get there together. So how can you help us get there? Be prepared. Learn about your pulmonary hypertension. Bring your medication list. Bring a list of all the doctors you want us to talk to and communicate Write your questions down in advance so we know what to focus on. Bring somebody with you because sometimes they're a good sounding board for you. They also may be a good scribe. They can write things down and they can help you navigate the questions you may have. Bring all of your insurance cards. Keep a diary of how you're doing, track your weights, and take your medications 
as we discussed. And if you can't, let us know. We want to know if you're not able to tolerate them because then we can reduce the dose, alter the medication, change, look at different strategies. So you being part of this decision-making is essential for your outcome. So you are working with this team and making it happen. You start by educating yourself, by listening to these videos, understanding your condition, and then tell us what you want. Tell us your goals. Tell us what's important to you. Make sure your family knows how you feel and what's really going on. And then communicate with us if things are not going well or if they are going well. I love to see someone send me a message in Epic or my computer system and tell me, hey, I'm feeling much better or I'm able to go to the grocery store again. Have a plan if you get sick, keep those specialty pharmacy numbers with you, keep your go pack with you with all your information, your medication, in case you do need some emergency care. So those are really, really important to make sure things go in the right direction as much as we can. And importantly, hang in there. This was a lot of information a lot of different medications, very complex names. You will get used to this. You will get better. It does get better. And importantly, make sure we know if we're not going in the right direction so we can redirect care. So thank you so very much for joining me. I hope I left with some important things you can take with you to your next visit and help you navigate this very complex condition of pulmonary hypertension.